So we are very, very happy to have Joe Nelson, who's going to share some reflections on cylindrical contact homology with us. Thanks for the invitation. Um, this is all going to be about joint work. My collaborator, Michael Hutchings, who is actually awake right now and watching. So that'll be fun for him, maybe. OK, so I was going to start just with um, a contact structure. And so that's going to be a maximally non-integrable hyperplane field. And as an example, we've got the standard contact structure on R3, which is expressed as the kernel of dz minus y dx. And then um, you can see by inspection, this is maximally non-integrable, but it could be better to go with an equation. And so the equations that will tell us when a one form is a contact structure is that we need lambda wedge d lambda to the n minus one to be a volume form. And that's equivalent to saying that d lambda restricted to its kernel is non-degenerate. And then for this talk, we're gonna be interested in building a chain complex out of um, periodic orbits. And so the vector field in question is the ray vector field. And that plays the role that the Hamiltonian vector field plays in um, symplectic geometry. And kind of the Hamiltonian role is played by the um, choice of the contact form that defines the contact structure. So the ray vector field is uniquely determined by lambda of r is one. And then you want the contraction of d lambda with r to be equal to zero. And um, that second equation tells you that the flow of the ray vector field uh, preserves the contact planes. And you can see that on the previous slide because the ray vector field is just ddz. And then you see that the flow, the, the, the flow preserves the contact planes as we move upwards in c. And then there's going to be a bunch of words I use a lot, so I just want to set some notation. So the ray flow is just defined as the usual thing. We want the time derivative to be r of the flow. And then we're going to be concerned with closed ray orbits, and we don't care about a parameterization of them. We just care about their image inside the contact manifold. So that's just going to be a map for us from um, r mod tz, where t is a uh, positive number that's the period of the orbit and then we want gamma dot to be equal to r of gamma and then we say that the ray orbit is embedded whenever this map is injective um, another synonym for embedded is simple but since working with michael i've realized that simple contact homology is really a misnomer it should be called embedded contact homology so rather than using the word simple i'm going to use embedded even though that's a bit of a difference in the nomenclature with the SFT world. And then um, given an embedded ray orbit, you can use the linearized flow along the ray orbit when we restrict it to the contact planes that gives us a symplectic linear map. And then when we plug in capital time T, we get a linearized return map and we can look at the eigenvalues of that linearized return map. And we know that it has to be a symplectic matrix and so um, we say that if one is not an eigenvalue of the linearized return map, then our orbit is non-degenerate. And uh, we say that the contact form is non-degenerate provided all the ray orbits associated to the contact form are non-degenerate. And so in particular, if we use a non-degenerate contact form, all of our ray orbits are gonna be isolated. And then in dimension three, I just wanted to, we'll see kind of bad orbits show up at some point. So I wanted to say what is going on in dimension three. And we can classify um, orbits which are non-degenerate as either elliptic or hyperbolic, depending on whether the linearized return map has eigenvalues on S1 or real eigenvalues. So if you have eigenvalues which are complex conjugates on S1, you're said to be elliptic. And if you have real eigenvalues, they come in pairs. So if they're real and negative, you have negative hyperbolic orbits. If they're real and positive, you have positive hyperbolic orbits. So as an example of a contact manifold, which actually has hyperbolic orbits, um, we've got the three sphere. So I'm gonna describe that as norm u squared plus norm v squared is one. Then the standard contact form is just coming from the primitive of the Fubini Studi form on C2 um, that we restrict to S3. And then uh, the orbits of the ray vector field form the Hopf vibration. And so this is a calculation that's simple when you get to a certain point in your career and then it becomes difficult again. 
So uh, what you do is you compute the rate vector field, you write, rewrite it in this more compact notation, and then you can confirm that the flow is e to the ITU, e to the ITV. And if you sit down and think about the Wikipedia page about the hot vibration, you'll see that over every point in S2, you exactly get an orbit of your rate vector field, which corresponds to the fiber of the hot vibration. And then Patrick Masseau is um, great at making illustrations of um, contact structures. I did take some liberty with his pictures and I turned them from teal into purple because I prefer the color purple. But so here we've got our array of contact planes and you could imagine this as being sort of uh, joining the point at infinity so you would have a whole like fibers worth and then you've got the rave flow is going to be transverse to these hyperplanes and that's the darker purple and then um, to kind of get at a, an idea of what this rave flow looks like um, Niles Johnson who's just a regular geometer topology kind of guy um, at one of the Ohio State campuses he figured out about 10 years ago how to program in magma um, a parametrization of the hop vibration using kind of reverse stereographic projection to view S3 um, as the solid ball and you would collapse the boundary to a single point just like how you blow a bubble with a two disc. And so um, down here in S2, every point lifts to a unique circle in um, S3 and the color of the point corresponds to the color of the fiber. And then we've got this nice uh, little animation he made so um, over the northern hemisphere, you'll see a solid torus. Over the southern hemisphere, you'll see a solid torus. And then along the equator, they're glued. And so this animation actually kind of shows you why you can view S3 as um, the union of two solid tori along their common boundary. Uh, the, the fiber at, it, at, at the North Pole, you would join the point at infinity, so it's technically closed. And then every fiber links with every other fiber exactly once. Each tori links with every other tori exactly once. Um, a kind of cool thing to look out for is if you see an arc downstairs on S2, that will lift in some cases to a J-holomorphic curve um, if you were to cross S3 with the R. And so my postdoc pointed out that in this video, you can almost kind of see pseudo-holomorphic curves appearing, especially if you were to have a more slow trajectory on S2, which you were looking at the pre-image of upstairs. Um, and then the video is just pretty cool. Um, so here's an arc downstairs, so we can kind of see that this looks indeed almost like a pseudo-holomorphic curve, which would be asymptotically cylindrical to two rave orbits on its ends. And um, then in a moment, Niles is going to show off his programming skills. And then this last kind of part of the animation I like because it kind of shows you what the rave flow looks like um, and is a lot more exciting anyways than the rave flow on R3. So uh, it's a good visualization. And then here's a, a little bit more at the end. So this is a great three minute video. Uh, when I showed it to Josh Sabloff, he got really excited because he didn't have to draw the hot vibration in real time uh, at the blackboard. And so now that everyone is virtual, um, this could be especially helpful. And if you just Google the hot vibration, this video will pop up. It's got really terrible music, so make sure you mute your volume before um, continuing. So next I wanted to um, say a little bit about kind of where contact geometry comes from. And fortunately I have this one minute clip from Helmut from his 60th birthday conference. And then I've paraphrased what Helmut is saying, but I know that I kind of don't always accurately ascribe uh, the correct words to people. So you can compare and contrast Joe's interpretation of the facts and the facts. So, so in particular, for example, why did I came into a symplectic geometry? So it, it turned out I had a flu. So, <laughs> so, so, so I, so I, I so th there was no, I mean, for the younger people, so today when you, you, you can get preprints from the archive, 
but uh, at that time somebody had to send it to you, so you got a preprint and so on, so it was more difficult. And I got hold of a paper by Rabinowitz, where um, he actually proved the existence of uh, periodic orbits on a convex on a starship energy surface. So now I got a copy of this, and usually I just put the copies away. I never read them. <laughs> but so I had this flu, and the only thing which was to read was that paper. <laughs> and, and it turned out that there was a fundamental new idea. And the fundamental new idea was that you can actually use the action function, which actually, if you now look back, makes possible a lot of things. For example, flow here and whatever we do. It could have been something else. Yeah? So the flu turned out to be really good. <laughs> okay, and I, I wanted to point out that it's really fortunate for the sake of our field that in the 70s, Netflix and email did not exist because in that case, it could be possible that we don't have a field to speak of. Um, so it was great that Helmut as a graduate student was uh, stuck at home with the flu with just a copy of Rabinowitz's uh, paper. And so I wanted to say then a few words about um, what this paper is. And so this kind of all goes back to this story about what's now called the Weinstein conjecture, which was formulated in 1978 by Alan Weinstein. Of course, this is not how the, the conjecture was originally formulated. This is its, its modern formulation. Oh yeah, Helmut, you can unmute yourself and make a remark. Yes, so uh, I just want to point out the other person who thinks to use this COVID-19 situation wisely is Dennis Sullivan. So he was, uh, a few weeks ago, he was supposed to show up at a seminar and then he started Zoom, and then his wife told him that Newton did his best work during the plague. So then he didn't show up to the seminar and went back to his desk. So, so I'll just end my talk now. <laughs> 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 well. All right. So um, the kind of first, well, not the first major result, but one of the big steps forward was a paper by Alan uh, Weinstein, where he proved the existence for convex hypersurfaces. And this was published in the annals. And Alan actually told me that um, when he submitted it to the annals, the referee said, this is no, like, no one cares about periodic orbits. And this problem kind of goes back to the, the Seifert conjecture. And so um, it turns out that the contact condition is kind of exactly what you need to force the existence of a closed periodic orbit. Um, the kind of the ray vector field is very special on a closed um, manifold. And so Alan told me he ended up sending in mimeographed correspondence of um, what Moser and Rabinowitz had written to him when he had first um, sent them a preprint of this result. And using this correspondence, he was able to convince the editors to override the wishes of the referee. So that was kind of a fun fact that I learned um, as a postdoc, although I have not yet submitted things to the annals and said, like, look at this beautiful letter that says it should be published. So that's maybe not what you want to do um, if you're not Alan Weinstein. And then uh, Rabinowitz, around the same time that Alan proved it for convex hypersurfaces, uh, Rabinowitz came up with a proof for star-shaped hypersurfaces. And then Alan was actually the referee for this paper. And so he made an arrangement with the editor to reveal himself. And at the end of the uh, journal uh, in which Rabinowitz's article appeared, uh, there was this little like five to 10 page document in which Alan formulates the Weinstein conjecture because he realized that the star-shaped um, condition is really a contact condition. So then, um, as Helmut said in his, goes on to say in this 16 minute clip that I'm not playing for you, the next, it was quite some time before a breakthrough and the person who made that breakthrough was Claude in 1987 where he proved um, that hypersurfaces of contact type in R2N admit a um, closed orbit. And the 80s fun refers to the fact that um, uh, in sort of the, the late 80s, um, it was a great time. So Helmut uh, recalled that Fleur was at Courant at that time, and Viterbo was doing military service at Courant because 
Uh, the French say that in lieu of military service, you can go to an underdeveloped country. And fortunately, New York City counted as an underdeveloped country, and it probably would still count today. And um, at the time um, that Fleur and uh, Claude were at uh, Courant, Helmut was tenure track at Rutgers, and um, Claude used to come down to Rutgers and fondly recalled having greasy hamburgers to start his day with Helmut before they started hunting for periodic orbits. Um, and of course, Hofer and Zander made some um, contributions as well. And then Hofer at the beginning of the 90s uh, was able to prove the Weinstein conjecture for S3 um, using kind of a failure of compactness in a certain sense of um, pseudo-holomorphic curves and the symplectization of a contact manifold. And then Taubes in um, the kind of early 2000s proved this in dimension three using Cyberg-Witten theory. And then there's been some progress since then in higher dimensions, um, but it's a long story and Helmut's got a beautiful two hours worth of lectures um, at the MSRI from 2008, which I highly recommend as viewing. And, um, oh, I had another fun thing to say. So I gave this talk not as slides, but as a board talk at what is probably going to be the last um, Northern California symplectic seminar of 2020. That was at the first week of March and um, seems like a lifetime ago. But so at dinner, I got to sit next to Alan and he kind of got a little bit freaked out because he couldn't remember exactly how he proved um, the existence of closed periodic orbits on convex hypersurfaces because he didn't use the actional, action functional for loops um, in the phase space, but he eventually kind of remembered. And then he told me that actually um, at the time, it was right after he had finished writing it, but it appeared in print in the annals when he was doing a, a year at Rice just kind of for fun as a sabbatical, but back then sabbaticals still required teaching. So he was teaching at Rice and um, we have really bad torrential rains and Alan actually lost a car because he was driving and he left the car and it got flooded and um, that was sad. And he had an offer from the time at Caltech, but he wasn't gonna go. But then his wife pointed out that um, if he went to Caltech, the salary difference between Berkeley and Caltech would enable them to buy a new car. That car also died, and he had a previous car as a graduate student, um, which he had to sell because of famine. And so he's lost cars now to famine, flood, and fire. And I'm gonna have to reach out to him to see if um, he's lost one to the plague at this point. Okay. So then um, I wanna talk a little bit, not really about like strategies for proving the Weinstein conjecture, but the machinery that was uh, invented to prove the Weinstein conjecture um, using pseudo-holomorphic curves eventually led to symplectic field theory because as Helmut says, um, the number of ideas is limited, but technology got fancier and fancier. And um, so then one could just recycle the ideas and that's what leads us to symplectic field theory. And um, so I'm gonna say a little bit, not about symplectic field theory, but I'm gonna talk about the cylindrical formulation since that's already pretty interesting. And so um, I'm gonna fix um, a non-degenerate contact form typically, and my manifold's always gonna be closed and the dimension is 2n minus one. And the kind of motivation was to try to flurify Morse theory on the following action functional on, for loops where you just integrate the contact form along um, a loop. And then a proposition reveals that the critical points of this action functional correspond to closed ray orbits. Now we're not gonna be able to look at um, gradient flow lines of this action functional, but fortunately in the early 2000s, Hofer, Vazatsky, and Zander really developed um, the theory of pseudo-holomorphic curves and symplectizations. And so those are gonna play the role of gradient flow lines but it's not like we can just appropriately interpret the sort of uh, gradient flow of this action functional the way that the story is told in, um, in Hamiltonian Fleur theory. And then uh, the gradient on our orbits is gonna be given in terms of the conley zander index. Now, technically this depends on a trivialization, um, and this is a sort of winding number associated to paths of symplectic matrices. And then we have this plus n minus three thing going on so that um, 
a, a, a formulation of a conjecture that I'm going to make doesn't depend on the dimension. And then um, the chain complex is generated by the set of what's called good Rabe orbits. And so Yasha actually, um, when I was giving my talk, he was very clear that Michael's contribution was the bad Rabe orbits. And so um, what are bad Rabe orbits? Well, in dimension three, they're going to be the even covers of embedded negative hyperbolic orbits. And when um, Eli Ashberg, Gibbon, Tall, and Hofer were working out what kind of SFT should look like, uh, Michael was a postdoc at Stanford at the time, and he was thinking a lot about embedded contact homology. And in the definition of embedded contact homology's chain complex, you have to be a little bit careful with hyperbolic orbits. And then it turns out that you also have to be a little bit careful about hyperbolic orbits in um, the realm of uh, symplectic field theory, but rather than um, just limiting to the embedded sort of hyperbolic orbits, it turns out it's okay to include the positive hyperbolic orbits as well as all their iterates. Um, you just have to exclude the even covers of embedded negative hyperbolic orbits. And there's kind of an analogous definition in higher dimensions where you look to see if you have um, pairs of pairs of um, negative uh, real eigenvalues associated to your linearized return map. And then um, we're going to need a almost complex structure. And so our almost complex structure and our symplectization is going to be said to be lambda compatible. Basically, if we get a metric when we plug it into the sort of canonically defined symplectic form on R cross Y, and then we also want to incorporate some of the geometry. So we want um, J to preserve the contact planes, and we want them to be positively rotated with respect to D lambda. And then we also um, want J to intertwine the R direction on the symplectization with the Rabe um, sort of flow direction on the symplectic manifold. And then gradient flow lines of that action functional don't work, but instead we can count um, elements of moduli spaces of pseudo-holomorphic cylinders. So those are going to be maps from a cylinder. So that's a sphere minus two points into the symplectization. Then we want the Cauchy-Riemann equation to be satisfied. So they're pseudo-holomorphic. And then um, they're what are called sort of finite energy or asymptotically cylindrical. And those uh, notions are equivalent. So it turns out that being asymptotically cylindrical to Rabe orbits so that's what is described in terms of these two limits. So as we go to um, the positive and minus ends um, of our sort of tube that's getting mapped into our symplectization, if we project to the R component, we want the positive end of the tube go to the positive infinity end. If we look at the minus infinity end of our tube, we want it to go to minus infinity in R cross Y. And then if we project our tube at the positive and minus ends to the um, contact manifold Y, then um, we want to see gamma plus and gamma minus up to reparametrization. And what's going to kind of cause some headaches for us is the fact that um, J is S1 independent. And so a lot of times we're going to be looking at moduli spaces of uh, multiply covered curves. And then we have kind of some issues with um, transversality and compactness. So cylindrical contact homology, the chain complex is going to be generated by um, the good ray orbits. So we have all of our closed ray orbits. We look at all of their covers, and then we throw out the bad orbits. We're going to throw out all the even covers of negative hyperbolic orbits. Those are going to be our generators. We've got the gradient is conley zander index plus n minus 3. And then there's two ways to define the differential. Um, and basically what's happening is because we include all of the, um, the embedded orbit as well as each of its iterates as separate generators, we have to be a little bit careful when we count so that we don't overcount. And that's what this coefficient of m of alpha divided by m of u is. So as kind of a cartoon, um, if I take gamma plus and gamma minus to be embedded ray orbits, and I take um, two inter positive integers whose greatest common divisor is one, then the um, finite energy cylinder that interpolates between these two orbits is going to be somewhere injective. And then we can look at an unbranched k-fold cover. And that's this cylinder that's interpolating between alpha and beta, where alpha is gamma plus to the kp, 
and beta is gamma minus to the kq, then the multiplicity of alpha is just um, the sort of number of iterates it is of an embedded ray orbit. So multiplicity of alpha is just this um, kp, multiplicity of beta is kq, and the multiplicity of the cylinder is going to be k. Um, and so it turns out that there's kind of two different differentials you can use, and they'll show up again. So I've got this EGH to indicate we um, encode the multiplicity at the top end of the cylinder, and I've got HGE to indicate that we encode the multiplicity at the bottom of the cylinder. And then the sort of, it wasn't really a conjecture, it might have been a series of propositions, but kind of the, the motivating idea for the next two decades, I guess, of um, some aspects of contact and symplectic um, geometry and topology um, was this notion of symplectic field theory. And so the idea for the cylindrical formulation was that if there's no contractible ray orbits with this grading minus one, zero, or one, and this is related to the definition of dynamically convex, because in dimension three, um, dynamically convex would mean if you're contractible, your conley zander index has to be at least three, and then you have three minus three, which is zero, and then n in this case for three manifold is two. So for dynamically convex, the grading of my contractible ray orbits is always going to be greater than or equal to two. So that gets us out of this danger zone. Um, and then in that case, um, the, the idea was that this should uh, give us a chain complex. And the homology of this chain complex is the cylindrical contact homology. And it should be an invariant of the, the contact structure, meaning it doesn't depend on the choice of contact form as long as you have this prescription about the contractible ray orbits and it doesn't depend on the choice of J. But the kind of idea was that some kind of abstract machinery like polyfolds would need to be developed to deal with all these transversality and compactness problems. So I wanna say a few words about um, what you can do without appealing to sort of Kuranishi atlases or polyfolds and what can be done kind of geometrically with current techniques that many people have developed over the years. And so there's going to be kind of two uh, important types of contact forms that are going to appear a lot. And so the first um, contact form that we will enjoy working with is a hypertight contact form. And hypertight just means that there's no contractible ray orbits. And then the other important class of contact forms is dynamically convex. And um, so here we need the first turn class of the contact distribution restricted to pi two to be zero. And what this is doing is telling us that no matter what trivialization we choose, um, for every contractible ray orbit, they can be kind of homotoped to another one. And so this condition that the conley zander index of all contractible ray orbits has to be greater than or equal to three is well defined and it, it, it's independent of the choices of trivializations we use for our contractible orbits. And what's kind of different from the classical literature is that for um, what Michael and I do, and I guess now what a lot of people have kind of done since then, is they include the class of hypertight contact forms inside the class of dynamically convex contact forms, even though technically back in kind of um, HWZ's day, they were really motivated to consider dynamically convex um, contact uh, manifolds because they arise as convex hypersurfaces, which are transverse to the radial vector field in R4. And then the dynamically convex contact form is just obtained by contracting the radial vector field with a standard symplectic form in R4. But for us, like, provided that we have this condition on our contractible orbits or we only have non-contractible orbits, so this condition is vacuously satisfied, we're just gonna say that that's the sort of dynamically convex condition. And then um, what Michael and I were able to show in 2014, which has since appeared in the Journal of Symplectic Geometry, is that if you're a three manifold, you're dynamically convex and you're generic, and we have this further, we needed this further assumption that every contractible ray orbit had conley zander index um, three only if the orbit was embedded. So we had to, because we used this kind of intersection theory and we needed asymptotics, um, results about the asymptotics of uh, holomorphic curves to rule out a bad configuration and proving that d squared is zero, um, we needed this extra assumption. 
Um, but since uh, we wrote this paper, um, Christopher o. Gardner, Hutchings, and Zhang, um, they studied the higher asymptotics and they were able to get the necessary formula to work out, provided that um, the contractible Rabe orbit, which had Conley's Zander index three, was a prime cover of an embedded Rabe orbit. And this paper isn't yet on the archive, but it is on Dan's website, and they prove a lot more interesting things than just, you know, weakening the assumptions of this theorem. But I, I wanted to give them a shout out because they do some really nice things with the, the higher asymptotics. And then um, some other results were that uh, Bao and Honda in 2014, they proved um, that the cylindrical contact homology differential was well defined and that it's squared to zero in the 3D hypertight case. And um, they were also able to get invariance, but they needed to um, be a little bit crafty. And so they got rid of all the elliptic orbits by considering kind of locally a, um, a, a period doubling like bifurcation and saying that you can convert all your elliptic orbits into another elliptic orbit that's got twice the action and then purely hyperbolic orbits below that. And so that allowed them to define the chain maps and cobordisms, but even then they still needed to use obstruction bundle gluing um, to consider what happens um, in the chain homotopy. And then if you want to kind of go with an abstract uh, perturbation machine, then uh, Pardon in 2015 proved that in any dimension, if you're hyper tight, you could get that D squared is zero and invariance, but you have to do this Kurinishi atlas business. So kind of what is the issue? So as probably all of us are aware, transversality for multiply covered curves is pretty hard. Maybe it's not hard anymore for Chris Wendell, but I'm sure he would still say that it's, it's, it's a thorny issue. Um, but at least not all hope is kind of lost in certain cases. Um, and so if we don't have transversality, we don't know if this moduli space is an orbifold or a manifold. And then that means that it can have non-positive virtual dimension. And as a result, we have pretty severe compactness issues. So I should say that these compactness issues are not really severe if you're Helmut, because Helmut used these compactness, this kind of failure of compactness to prove the existence of a periodic orbit. Because um, in his proof of the Weinstein conjecture, he showed that it's um, a, the, the existence of a closed periodic orbit is equivalent to finding a non-constant curve because of Stokes. And so he, he really employed this failure of compactness. Um, but for kind of the, the, the sake of just trying to define a chain complex, compactness looks pretty thorny because we're not actually trying to prove the Weinstein conjecture anymore. We're trying to come up with a chain complex. So the kind of cartoon is that here I've got um, just the usual thing where I have a, a cylinder going from X to Z, and I would want to show that if it has index difference two, then um, after I mod out by R, uh, the only kind of formula, the only way it could break if I have such a sequence of cylinders is into a once broken um, uh, cylinder where each component has index difference one. And the issue is that um, you can have this kind of a holomorphic plane bubbling happening when you have the existence of contractible Rabe orbits. And this isn't supposed to really be geometrically meaningful other than the fact that I picked a bunch of numbers that sum to two. And then in some cases you can exclude some of these configurations in um, symplectizations and dimension uh, for three dimensional contact manifolds. And that was kind of the 30 pages worth of fun that Michael and I had in our JSG paper. So um, what Michael and I did uh, was to kind of see how we could use the ideas of um, domain dependent, almost complex structures, which were introduced, I think, uh, most prominently by Silibach and Monka um, in uh, trying to understand gromov witten invariants without appealing to sort of Kurinishi um, atlases. And then a lot of these ideas have also appeared in work by Bourgeois Wancha and Bourgeois Eliasberg Ekholm. Um, so I want to give everyone a shout out and not really say that what Michael and I did was, you know, extraordinary, but we're just taking on work of a lot of people and building on it and see, seeing really how we can push existing techniques to get well-defined contact invariants without having to appeal to polyfolds or um, Kurinishi 
atlases because it can be really important for um, computations and applications. So the sort of moral is that S1 independent J cylinders in the simplectization of a three manifold are actually quite reasonable. We have these nice iteration formulas for the conley zander index, and we can show that sort of the index of a multiply covered cylinder is always greater than that of its underlying um, somewhere injective cylinder when we consider an unbranched cover. And then we can appeal to automatic transversality to say that these cylinders are, these moduli spaces are cut out transversely. But this, this um, kind of framework completely fails in cobordisms. And so that means that we don't have any obvious chain maps. So the idea would be then to try to see um, what happens if we try to force domain dependence so that we can guarantee that all of our uh, moduli spaces are uh, cut out transversely because they're somewhere injective. And so the kind of issue that arises there is if you introduce um, domain dependent almost complex structures and you sit down and write what kind of the EGH differential would be, you're not going to be able to prove that it squares to zero anymore because this um, Eliashberg given to Hofer cylindrical theory is really kind of a, well, it's an orbifold theory because you're basically looking at the homology of the loop space um, quotiented out by the S1 action rather than S1 equivariant um, homology of the loop space. Um, and so what Michael and I do is we use kind of more spot ideas where we think of the bot manifold as this rave orbit that's the generator of our chain complex. And so if you were to put a height function on um, a circle, it would give rise to two critical points. And those two kind of critical points correspond to the new generators of our chain complex. So our chain complex is generated by two copies of each embedded rave orbit and gamma check and gamma hat are gonna be formal symbols. Uh, gamma check lives in the homology of the image of gamma, the zeroth homology group, and gamma hat is gonna live in the first homology group of the image of gamma. And so that's kind of like, when you think about the Morse index at the max, you're gonna be um, increasing your grading by one, and at the min, your index is just gonna be zero. Um, and we're not actually doing sort of like a Morse bot theory. We're not really studying cascades. We just set up everything purely as like an algebraic formality. And then Michael and I have a paper from 2017 where we lay out this axiomatic Morse bot um, framework for where we give kind of a set of axioms that moduli spaces have to satisfy. And if they do, then we can say that some differential is well-defined and it squares to zero and it's an invariant. And then we show that this, uh, our formulation of non-equivariant uh, contact homology fits into this axiomatic more spot framework. So we can just turn that crank and go. And so the, the, the non-equivariant um, differential, it turns out to have kind of a matrix format and it's the fact that this matrix squares to zero. So D check is not gonna square to zero when we use an S1 dependent almost complex structure, but this whole matrix squares to zero. And um, a lot of these terms are gonna be kind of familiar because they were sketched in um, the Bourgeois, the Ashberg, Ekholm paper. So D plus, so if we have enough regularity to use an autonomous J, then between good rave orbits, D check will agree with the Eli Ashberg given to Hofer definition, which encodes the multiplicity of the top orbit. D hat is going to be agreeing with um, what's counted where we encode the multiplicity of the bottom orbit. So that's that HGE. And then D plus is this two bad map. So when you have bad, a bad orbit, it spits out a, it's gonna spit out a negative two instead of a two. Um, that's kind of a different story we're not gonna talk about. And then between good rave orbits, D plus is gonna be zero. And then D minus, it turns out that we needed a novel obstruction bundle gluing correction term and actually to, in order to actually conclude that this, this differential squares to zero. And we'll come back to kind of what happens in the autonomous case um, a little bit later, but when we set this up with an S1 dependent J, which is how we um, will get chain maps and the chain homotopy and get all our transversality, we have to be a little bit careful because we're not gonna be able to use an autonomous J um, in general, but we can in certain circumstances. Um, 
And so the upshot is gonna be that this non-equivariant theory is a contact invariant. And I'll say a few more words in the upcoming slides about how it's kind of defined and what goes into it. And then um, we can actually relate the non-equivariant theory to the original theory of Elie Ashberg given to Alan Hofer if we do a Borel construction akin to what Bourgeois and Wancha worked out for S1 equivariance and flectic homology, but we'll do it in this realm of contact homology. Um, so we do this Borel construction and then we show that if we tensor it with Q, we can actually get the original Elie Ashberg given to Alan Hofer theory when sort of this is defined, meaning when there exists a J for which our cylinders are gonna be reasonable. So typically um, you can really only define this in dimension three or um, when you're working with a situation that's hyper tight and you only have um, orbits in uh, 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 primitive free homotopy classes to ensure somewhere injectivity. So um, once we introduce this family of J's, when we look at our moduli spaces, they're gonna end up having one greater dimension than um, they did without using an autonomous J. And so we're gonna have to use point constraints in order to cut down the dimension of the moduli space so that we're actually counting elements of a zero dimensional moduli space when we sit down and write out the differential. So here I've got a cartoon of a cylinder we can look at u of r cross zero, that's gonna be some curve. And then we're gonna um, fix generic pace points on um, the rave orbit alpha and beta. And so we look at the underlying um, embedded orbit and we use an overline to indicate that alpha bar is sort of the underlying embedded rave orbit of alpha. But in the image, when we look at why their images are the same. So here I haven't specified any point constraints on the cylinder because ev plus is this point and ev minus is gonna be this point. So we're just looking at the plus or minus infinity ends. When we project u, um, where we plug in t equals zero for the s1, and we see what happens at plus infinity and minus infinity. And then um, and when we define our cascade moduli spaces, we can use a generic base point um, to kind of force constraints. So we'll have a point constraint at the top of our cylinder or of our building, if E plus is this P alpha, we'll have a point constraint at the bottom if E minus is P beta. So then there's four different ways you can arrange point constraints. And for now, we're just gonna look at the base level cascade more spot moduli spaces. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll explain why this kind of word cascade shows up. But here, these just have, um, they just consist the first level just has one cylinder in each of them. And then these markings, the alpha, the check in the hat is formal in a certain sense, but it also indicates whether or not we've specified a point constraint. So if we look at the alpha, which is the first component of our, like the first thing that appears, the plus infinity end, if we see a check, then that means that we're gonna impose a point constraint at the top. So we would want this, um, e plus to actually match up with this red dot. And so here we see a point constraint at the top um, for alpha, for the moduli space going from alpha check to beta check. And here we see a point constraint at the top when we go from alpha check to beta hat. And then here there's an alpha hat and an alpha hat, so there's no point constraint. And we do a similar thing for the betas, except we only impose a point constraint when we see a beta hat. And so the beta hats are these two guys. And so we see a point constraint at the bottom and a point constraint at the bottom. And then our differential, um, when we look at the matrix, those individual terms typically won't be differentials. Um, they're just gonna be chain maps, but then the chain maps will kind of be detecting uh, cylinders and buildings that either have a point constraint at the top, a point constraint at the bottom, no point constraints, or a point constraint at both the top and the bottom. So these are the base levels, and then we're gonna look at um, sort of more uh, like actual cascades. So these are gonna be tuples of broken cylinders that have a certain cyclic ordering condition. And as a set, each of these spaces will be a disjoint union of subsets um, of MJ um, with whatever the sort of upper limit, the, the asymptotic Rabe orbit limits uh, will impose. 
So as a picture, I've drawn a three-level cascade moduli space. And here I've got uh, an alpha check because I'm imposing a point constraint at the topmost level. And I've got a beta hat, which means I'm going to impose a point constraint at the bottom most level. And then um, I'm going to have a cyclic ordering condition. So in order to say that, I kind of have to tell you exactly what these cascade moduli spaces are. So we're going to have a bunch of distinct ray orbits. And then the higher levels um, are going to be the set of tuples so that if we see a check appear where this twiddle is, then we need a, a point constraint on the topmost level of our building. So that's exactly what's going on in this topmost cylinder here. If I see that the beta has a hat, then that means I'm going to need a point constraint on the bottom most level. So that's what's going on here. And then I want the cyclic ordering of F minus of the uh, cylinder, the sort of preceding cylinder. And then I'm going to look at F plus of the next cylinder. So they're going to be living on sort of the same ray orbit. And then I can look at the choice of generic base point, And that's this purple dot. And I want them to be cyclically ordered with respect to the ray flow. And that's where kind of the cascade is coming in. Because you're cascading from this F minus, whatever that happens to be, to F plus. And that's your little kind of tiny cascade. But we're not actually doing cascade more spot theory. We do it in a purely axiomatic way so that we don't actually have to sit down and think about um, what's going on in the more spot situation with our moduli spaces. But that's kind of why it's called the cascade. And this is the, the little cascades that you want to imagine when you think about um, these moduli spaces in the buildings. And then if um, alpha is equal to beta, then uh, alpha check check, alpha check hat, alpha hat hat, these are all going to be the empty set. And um, if we're looking at the moduli space from alpha hat to alpha check, meaning that there's no point constraint, then when alpha is bad, we get negative two points, and it's going to be the empty set when alpha is good. So this should look pretty familiar from BEE and sort of symplectic homology with that too bad map. Okay, so um, our differential it has this nice matrix uh, formulation. So they're defined in terms of all these little chain maps. And um, D check goes from check to check. So it's going to eat a check to generator and spit out a check to generator. And then it's going to give a count of all of sort of the cascade. Uh, the elements of the cascade moduli spaces that interpolate between uh, alpha and beta, where you've got a point constraint on the topmost level on alpha and no point constraint on the bottom. Um, D plus, you're going from hat to check, so there's no point constraints. D minus goes from check to hat, so there's a point constraint at the top and a point constraint at the bottom. So that's why we have the index difference of the orbits needs to be two, because then you would subtract the two point constraints to get your zero dimensional um, moduli space count. And then D check is the analog of D hat, except we've got a point constraint on the bottom. And then the little cartoon for the types of cylinders that these um, D check, D plus, D hat, D minus are counting are arranged in this picture. So here, um, I've kind of, it's a little bit of a lie because if we use a domain dependent J, you would expect to have more than one level in your cascade moduli spaces typically, because it's okay to have um, a cylinder between index difference zero ray orbits when you have a non-autonomous J. But if you were to use an autonomous J, you wouldn't see a cylinder between index difference zero ray orbits unless it was the trivial cylinder. So here you can kind of think of this as being this, the picture or the cartoon for the simplification when there is sufficient transversality to use a domain independent J. So here I've just got the point constraint at the top, no point constraint at the bottom for D check. Uh, D plus has no point constraints at all. And because you would be looking at index difference zero, that means that um, if you were to use an autonomous J, you would expect to only be seeing trivial cylinders. And that's kind of why that negative two zero pops out, um, depending on whether we input a bad or a good orbit. And then 
in this this corner. These two um, guys live in this cascade moduli spaces. They're cylindrical, but this OBG term is actually going to be giving a contribution coming from um, the existence of a branched cover of a trivial cylinder. So this blue X indicates the branch point. And then we've got our contractible orbit gamma, which is gonna have conley zander index three. It would be the short rave orbit in the ellipsoid. Um, and we're gonna have to figure out kind of the number of ways that we can glue a plane to this, uh, this uh, branch cover of a trivial cylinder. And then um, D um, hat is the analog of D check, except it's got a point constraint at the bottom. And because of this point constraint at the top and this point constraint at the bottom, when we use an autonomous J, that's how we see D check spit out the Eliasberg Givental Hofer differential coefficient because this point constraint at the top is seeing the multiplicity of the top ray orbit. And for D check, we see the opposite differential because we've got a point constraint at the bottom. And so that's encoding the multiplicity of the bottom ray orbit in a certain sense. And then what Hutchings and I proved in 2019. Um, we did this for the hypertight setting, and now what we're working on is writing up this obstruction bundle gluing correction term, which would allow us to work with the three-dimensional dynamically convex case. Um, is that for a generic um, S1-dependent family J of lambda-compatible almost complex structures, this differential is well-defined, it squares to zero, and its homology is independent of the choice of lambda and J. And so then the way that you could use an autonomous J is if you have enough transversality to use an autonomous J, you'll be able to prove that the differential is well-defined and that it squares to zero. And then you obtain invariance because you say, oh, I could take a small domain-dependent nearby perturbation. And by the implicit function theorem, the differential counts have to be the same. And if I'm using a small domain-dependent perturbation, then I can appeal to the fact that this non-equivariant contact homology is actually independent of the choices I made. So you kind of have to be a little bit careful when you use autonomous J, but it is gonna be feasible to do it if you kind of go through and look at all your moduli spaces. So um, next I wanna say a few words about what's going on with this obstruction bundle gluing term. So um, given some branch cover, and this R indicates that we've kind of gotten bounds on the ramification point, which is this branch point, meaning that it can't run off to plus infinity or minus infinity. Um, so we've got some pre-glued curve that's got this um, branched cover of the plane and then a, a, a non-trivial cylinder, and we want to perturb it to get an honest holomorphic curve. But near the branch point um, of our uh, branched cover, we can only perturb in directions normal to uh, R cross gamma. And then the obstruction bundle sort of gluing framework says that we'll obtain a unique pseudo-holomorphic curve if and only if the gluing obstruction vanishes, which is given in terms of some section of an obstruction bundle over the kind of space of branched covers. And then the count of gluings is gonna be related to a count of zeros of this obstruction section. And um, the fiber of this bundle is given in terms of the dual of the co-kernel of this uh, deformation operator, which encodes um, being able to perturb only in directions normal to R cross gamma. And the rank is given by the dimension of um, this moduli space of branched covers. And what's different in um, the setting that Michael and I consider from the setting that Michael considered with Taubes for proving that the ECH differential squares to zero is that in Hutchings and Taubes' um, construction, their branch points were allowed to vary. So this X was not fixed, um, but the objects that they glued together were fixed. Whereas for us, this branch point is gonna be fixed, but this glued object P um, which is a plane, is going to be allowed to vary within the moduli space of planes. And we kind of see this um, arise geometrically, which we'll see in the next slide. And then um, the result that Hutchings and I are working on writing the details up of is that if we're dynamically convex dimension three, J is generic, autonomous, then um, if gamma is an embedded elliptic contractible ray orbit, then the obstruction bundle gluing contribution um, between gamma D check to gamma D minus one hat 
is given in terms of some winding number which is associated to the leading coefficient of the asymptotic operator associated to the plane. So it's gonna be the degree of some map from the moduli space of index two planes asymptotic to gamma modulo r to S1. I'll try to explain this um, in kind of two slides. So the um, obstruction bundle term is, uh, it's needed even for sort of the simple ellipsoid. And here we're going to take an irrational ellipsoid. And uh, we're going to be looking at the D minus plus OVG terms. We want the index difference to be two because we would have two point constraints. And it turns out that the differential coefficient from alpha check to beta hat has to be, or sorry, alpha hat to beta check has to be plus or minus one, or else the homology comes out wrong. And the OBG term is gonna show up when alpha is um, the K plus one iterate of a short ray orbit with conley zander index three, and beta is the Kth iterate so that the index difference when you're the short ray orbit for some K is equal to two. And from the annals papers of Hofer, Vazetsky, and Zander from the late 90s, early 2000s, we know that the holomorphic planes bounded by gamma give a foliation of the ellipsoid. And then it follows from this that the obstruction bundle term is plus or minus one, if you understand what you're doing. And what's kind of remarkable is that an intersection theory argument shows that D minus won't give us this plus or minus one because there's gonna be no purely cylindrical contributions to the differential coefficient. We go from alpha hat to beta check. So how does obstruction bundle gluing work? So you have some embedded ray orbit. Uh, C is some cylinder, P is some plane, they're both immersed. Sigma is some branched cover. We're gonna fix the R coordinate of the branch point, and this is gonna be akin to a gluing parameter. It turns out that the dimension of the co-kernel of this deformation operator associated to um, the branch cover sigma is two. We're gonna fix a point constraint at the bottom of um, our branch cover, so that's this purple dot. And then we're gonna fix a translation of C, and that's another gluing parameter. And then after we fix the R coordinates of C, gamma, and P, we're gonna have three degrees of freedom. One degree comes from the S1 coordinate of the branch point, and two degrees of freedom come from the choice of the plane P within, its mod within the moduli space of planes. And we have three constraints. So one sort of constraint comes from the conformal constraint corresponding to this point constraint X, or sorry, the point constraint that we're talking about is not X, it's the point constraint at the bottom of uh, sigma. And then the two remaining constraints arise from the gluing obstruction. And what Michael and I can show is that there's a unique choice of an S1 coordinate which agrees with the conformal constraint which means that this choice of plane within its moduli space is these two degrees of freedom correspond to the, the remaining constraints left to us by the gluing obstruction. So how does the gluing obstruction spit out this winding number? So we've got the same picture as before, and we're gonna look at a non-zero um, element of the co-kernel and consider its asymptotic eigenfunctions. And um, we can check that this uh, is actually, a, this psi is actually a, a 1D complex vector space and hence a section. And then we're gonna look at the um, asymptotic operators associated to gamma D and gamma and look at the um, elements which are in the leading eigenspace of these operators and call them psi D and psi one. And the, this kind of works because you can pull back eigenspaces and when you're elliptic, you can, uh, assume that your asymptotic operators are complex linear. And then um, we'll take the, um, we'll do a similar thing for the cylinder and plane and psi C and psi P are gonna be the associated asymptotic eigenfunctions for the cylinder and plane. And then if J is generic, uh, Hutchings and Taubes guarantee that everything is non-vanishing. And then the gluing obs obstruction is gonna come from some count of zeros. So many pages of math are gonna allow us to actually use an approximation to the section. And that's um, a bulk of the work that's done in the hutchings Tobbs 2 paper. Um, and so we're gonna get this approximation to the 
the, the, set zero, the section and we want to set this equal to zero or see if we can make it zero and that's going to tell us when we can actually glue these, this configuration together. And then everything is going to be fixed except for psi p because p can move around in its moduli space. But otherwise, in the previous slide, I kind of fixed everything. And so there's going to be no movement. And so uh, we can check that the number of ways to glue is going to be given by the choices of p so that this holds. And as a result, it suffices to find the zeros of the linearized section, which is given in terms of the coefficients of the leading order terms. And so this a, c, and a, p are some coefficients. The a, c is fixed because psi, c is fixed. But this guy is allowed to kind of vary, and so is this a, p. And so that's going to allow us to find a unique um, coefficient a, p, and c minus 0, because psi is a one-dimensional complex vector space, which we can um, identify with c. And then translation in r will correspond to multiplication by e to the s. And in that way, we get a sort of winding number, um, which gives us the number of ways to glue. And then this is just a brief advertisement that we're going to have obstruction bundle gluing or obstruction bundle zooming in the fall. And um, Jacob Rooney and I are going to be organizing it. And we've got some speakers lined up. It'll be weekly in September, sometime after 10 AM Pacific Daylight Time. And I'm almost out of time. So I just want to kind of quickly say that um, we can imitate the construction of bourgeois and Wancha um, to do a family Fleur type equivariant theory for our non-equivariant chain complex. So we tensor uh, with the cohomology ring of CP infinity. And then we've got BV, a BV operator, which would be D1 tensor U inverse, and then all the higher things. These, these pieces here are corresponding to sort of the, the index difference of the, the gradient flow lines on CP infinity. Um, we're going to use a non-autonomous J. In fact, it's going to be an S1 equivariant S1 cross ES1 dependent family of lambda compatible almost complex structures. You fix a perfect Morse function on um, S infinity. And then given Rabe orbits and critical points of this perfect Morse function, you consider pairs of gradient flow. So it's going to be upwards gradient flow on CP infinity, which is asymptotic to points in the pre-image of um, your critical points in S infinity, and we, they'll lift to some circle inside of CP infinity. And then uh, the other uh, component is going to be pseudo-holomorphic curves, which have this uh, J, which depends on the ES1 parameter. That's the eta of S. And then it's got the S1 parameter. That's the T. We want them to be asymptotic to gamma plus minus. And we're going to have some moduli space, which is the quotient of this solution set. And then we also have evaluation maps. And we can run the axiomatic S1 more spot framework um, that Michael and I wrote up in 2017. And we get that in the hypertight case, which we proved in 2019, where once the obstruction bundle gluing details are worked out, we can weaken to be three-dimensional and dynamically convex. That for a generic family, we get a chain complex. And the homology is independent of the choice of lambda and j. And um, I'm not going to do this slide, but it basically just goes through all the ways you can do a simplification of the various differentials when there is enough transversality to get, a, um, uh, get that the differential is well defined and show that it squares to 0. So great, a bunch of equations. And then the main thing is that um, when we do have this regularity to use an autonomous j, um, so the differential is well defined and it squares to 0. In particular, this is the case for generic J in dimension 3, and you're dynamically convex. Then we have this canonical isomorphism between the S1 equivariant homology after we tensor with Q with the Eli Ashberg given tall Hofer theory. And so there's three algebraic steps, which Michael and I explain in our 2019 paper. And similar arguments have appeared in work by Gut and Bourgeois Wancha and others. Um, and then uh, as a kind of corollary, this allows us to actually say that when you can define the Eli Ashberg given to Hofer um, theory using an autonomous J, that actually you, it doesn't depend on the choice of lambda or on J because of this abstract isomorphism, or it's not abstract, because of this canonical isomorphism with S1 equivariant. Um, uh, cylindrical contact homology, and because we know that this 
right hand side is an invariant, meaning it doesn't depend on lambda and j, we can conclude that the right hand side is also an invariant. And I'll stop here. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let's let's thank the speaker. So if, if people have any questions, please r write them down so that we have a record in the chat and then Joe will just um, call, call you out to um, ask them in person. I, I don't know if you can see me. My computer crashed, so I'm calling through my phone. Oh, I see you. You are blurrier than you usually appear. Okay, yeah. yes, great. Oh, and also if people want to ask questions when we're not recording, that's fine too.